hit the record button. And um, so if everybody could just um, introduce themselves in one minute or less, um, that would be great. I'm gonna start with uh, uh, Chiara. Hi everybody, I'm Chiara De Santi from Farm Interstate College. It's part of SUNY. We are um, located on Long Island, one hour from New York City. I'm a faculty of modern languages, assistant professor, and I'm also the COIL academic coordinator on campus. Great, thank you. Good, I'm gonna make it 30 seconds. Okay, Cassette, you're next. I'm probably not saying it right. I'm uh, Cosette Joyner Martinez from Oklahoma State University, and I'm a professor here in um, fashion merchandising. Awesome. And uh, Maria Cristina. Good morning, everyone. I'm Maria Cristina Montoya, and I work at SUNY Onionta. I teach Spanish. And I guess as Kiara, I am the COIL academic coordinator. <laughs> Uh, on my campus. So this is my first time here with you and I hope to share a lot of thoughts. Great. Um, Zoe. Hello everyone. Uh, hi, Jamie. We spoke last time last summer, I think. Um, nice to see everybody. Um, I am Associate Professor of French at St. John's University. And I'm also Senior Director for Global Engagement and uh, Academic Coordinator for our uh, COIL program at St. John's University in New York. Thank you. Great. And um, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Smalls. I teach, I'm a full-time faculty in the nursing department at SUNY Brockport, which is in Western um, New York, not terribly far from Buffalo. Okay, Betsy. Hi, I'm Betsy Yudi. I'm a professor of gender studies and the COIL coordinator at California State University Stanislaus in the Central Valley of California. Great. And um, uh, maybe we also want to start, I just put in the chat, like what you're hoping to get out of this discussion. Um, and just to help Jamie frame what she's going to talk about. Um, uh, Ines. Hello, I'm Ines Maxid. I'm the study abroad coordinator at Stephen F. Austin State University here in East Texas. Uh, we are new with COIL. Um, we are starting our first group of uh, professors uh, doing their workshop, their first workshop of COIL this June. And assessment is one of the questions that we all have how we are going to do this. <laughs> so Thank this you. comes very uh, in Canada. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emmy at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Jamie, I was at NCAIE uh, and heard John talk about some of the data that you've been collecting and publishing. So I was really um, excited to hear you talk more about that today. Awesome. Um, Annette. Oh, we're just introducing ourselves in 30 seconds or less. And um, we're just putting what you want to get out of the session in the chat. Oh, okay, thank you, sorry. Se security precautions in our system, which everyone here can appreciate. So I was a bit delayed today, <laughs> sorry. I had to sign my third child away or something. <laughs> Annette Ritchie at the University at Albany, um, SUNY, and um, Quo coordinator here, um, among other things. And nice to see you all. And thank you so much for joining us, Jamie and Jose Luis. Jose Luis. Hello, uh, my name is Jose Luis Jimenez. I am a COIL coordinator of uh, Andres Bello Catholic University in Venezuela. And I'm very pleased to be with you today. Excellent. And uh, Marie, 
Patterson, King's College. Hi. Yep. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Marie Patterson. I work for King's College in the occupational therapy department. Um, this is my first time here, um, so I'm still getting familiar with your organization. Um, but my uh, overarching goal is to, um, so I coordinate our students' clinical placements or their clinical internships. Um, so I would like to um, learn more information about collaborating with um, organizations um, throughout the country, but more likely um, internationally um, to, to send our students to. Um, and Jay Zhang. Hello everyone, this is Jay Zhang. Uh, from SUNY Broadport. Hi, Jennifer. Nice to see you again. Um, I'm a professor of special education um, and I have been doing COIL for several years and uh, um, I'm here to learn about assessment. I think that's a big topic. So look forward to learning about that. Thank you. All right, great. So um, Jamie, just so you know, we have had a core group um, of folks who have been talking about assessment and COIL for the past couple of years now, um, Annette and Betsy and Emmy's been on and off part of that and Zoe's been part of that and um, Chiara and we've been and, and Jose Jose Luis. Luis. yes and we've been we originally put together our own assessment tool and then um, sort of got tripped up a little bit and then started looking at Purdue's um, intercultural tool um, and looking at ha having that be a good way for people to assess, um, but also fraught with some issues too, <laughs> um, just in that noticing that um, do you do the orientation first and then do you do the survey? Do you, um, just lots of questions. And so um, it's really nice to have you here today just to give another perspective and another approach to thinking about assessment and from a completely different angle. So um, we're thrilled that you're here and um, that also to hear from Jose Luis and hearing about the connection of empathy to um, what our students are getting out of doing this kind of work. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jamie. Okay, so I think I might have not gotten the correct focus because I didn't realize it was focused on assessment, but I'd rather focus on research, but they're very similar, right? <laughs> so so um, I do have a, should I do, do, how, what's the, what do you typically do here? Do you want to do we want to do a presentation? Do we want to just talk? Um, I would love for you to present some of your findings. I think. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so Annette put something in the chat. Um, I've heard both Jamie and Jose Luis present on coil and empathy. I like what put the other what what to enrich and complete our own survey of COIL. Um, do you want to go up further about that, Annette? Well, I was just responding to what we were supposed to put in the chat in the first place. I'm not talking about what Amy should be doing now, but you had sent an email about what the expectations for today were. So we're just excited. I think a lot of people here haven't heard either Jamie or Jose Luis talk about their research on empathy. So I think that's that's cool. And it may not be necessarily today that we fully unpack and apply it to our survey. I, you know, that's more just kind of takeaway and homework. But mm -hmm. in a sense, I mean, we we're kind of having a hard time even within our assessment group knowing how to ask students about their empathy at the start and during and the end. So yeah. 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 Okay. So I have a that's that's helpful. And actually, because um Empathy is a tough nut. Um, empathy is actually really <laughs> hard to measure. And there's so many instances of, of actual failure in measuring empathy because it is so hard to measure. Um, let me share my screen. Give me one moment. 
Where is my PowerPoint? Why isn't it showing up on my options? Uh -huh. oh. Weird. There Love we technology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, technology from here is something fun as well because All right. at the time my internet's not working. So <laughs> let's hope for the best for today. <laughs> okay, so so I've I've we've been working on research at uh, ECU. You know, for those of you who don't know East Carolina University, um, we've been doing a virtual exchange, not really COIL. We've only recently started doing COIL, and we're trying to build more of COIL. But we've been doing a different model of virtual exchange since um, we piloted in 2003. Uh, we had our first formal course in 2004. We developed a office dedicated to virtual exchange in 2005. I myself have been involved since uh, 2005, first as an instructor. I used to teach two to three virtual exchange courses a semester, did that for about 10 years until I kind of moved into leadership and took over when our founders retired, which was in 2014. So we we have like a mature program, which is great for doing research, right? Because we can, um, we have 10 plus years of institutional data that we can pull from. And then uh, 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 core of classes that we can do uh, each semester, uh, do assessment data, essentially. Um, before we get into the empathy, I just wanted to kind of highlight, we, we've done other research as well. Um, this is just uh, some of our key findings that we've had. Um, more recently, we've been really focusing on assessment of uh, our students pre to post course. We've always done a pre and post course survey with our students. Um, we are limited in doing surveys, which is a limitation, right? We recognize that. I particularly as an anthropologist recognize that having more qualitative data would be fabulous, but no one here has the time to do that. The analysis and the uh, more appropriate data collection is really proven to be challenging for us just because we're we do so much um so we have been just doing surveys um and again we've been doing this for forever the pre and post course surveys but only recently have we tied our assessment of virtual exchange to an overall framework that we've developed for ecu when it comes to intercultural learning so um about three years ago now, we developed what we call the Pirates Framework. We did a bunch of focus groups with faculty members, with um, uh, people in student affairs, with people in academic affairs, and then um, some student groups as well to understand uh, what we should be trying to develop amongst our students. A part of our mission at ECU is to prepare students with the knowledge, skills, and values to succeed in a global multicultural society. Well, what knowledge, what skills, what values, right? You can't measure it unless you know what they are. So through our process of doing these focus groups and analysis, um, we developed the Pirates framework. Uh, it just so happens Pirates is also our mascot. So it's a good uh, mnemonic. We, we massage things slightly to fit that mnemonic. Um, it's, it's really helpful for keeping it on people's minds right at ECU. So the, the seven characteristics we're measuring over in a three-year cycle is perspective taking, inquisitiveness and openness, respectfulness, adaptability, tolerance of ambiguity, empathy, and self-awareness. Move ahead. Um, so preliminary findings from the, the Pirates research is that uh, international virtual exchange improves intercultural empathy and perspective taking, but only among females. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in just a minute. Um, however, for year two, we looked at respectfulness and openness. Um, and we found that IV has, uh, has uh, significantly statistically significant impact on respectfulness and openness, uh, but not self-awareness, which was surprising. Um, we've actually been looking at all these things in comparison. Uh, so study abroad, uh, virtual exchange. Uh, we have things called global diversity courses that are 
are have at least a component that focus on something global, but doesn't have any direct interaction with like in virtual exchange or study abroad. Um, and then we also have domestic diversity. And then we also had a control group. And it was interesting where things were higher and lower. Virtual exchange did really well all around, but um, we'll look at that in just a second. And, and this year we're currently collecting data on tolerance of ambiguity and adaptability. Because this is our first cycle, these we're seeing looking at as baseline numbers uh, and then hope to, we've been trying to uh, do uh, work with faculty here to help them build strategies to increase those skills through their coursework, um, not necessarily for virtual exchange, more we're focusing more on our global diversity and domestic diversity because they're not doing so well. Um, uh, so we hope that in the future, those numbers will go up. So these are uh, the, the definitions, the lay definitions that we use within our Pirates framework. These are very basic definitions. However, academically, they don't quite match up, right? Cut it. So um, we've also, when we're doing our research, these are the definitions that we're focused on. Um, I said empathy is a tough nut because empathy is a tough nut. Um, there's um, there's very little consensus on what empathy really is. There's lots of breakdown of different types of empathy and how empathy uh, should be looked at in terms of whether it should be based on behavior or based on um, thought and co cognitive issues or and how people think about things. Um, so there's lots of different ways to look at empathy. And what we found is that different scales that measure empathy measure very different things and are more or less appropriate for different settings. So for example, we'll, uh, let me just talk about these definitions first and then I'll talk about that, that issue of, of which scales are appropriate and which are not and, and how we kind of, where we ended up with that. So um, we're using these two definitions. Cog Perspective taking is actually a type of empathy. Again, empathy is this really big thing that you can unpack. Perspective taking is one type of empathy. Um, so the, the definition that we're using is related to cognitive empathy, which is commonly known as perspective taking, the intellectual process we use to assess others' viewpoints, taking into consideration their thoughts, context, feelings, and lived experiences. Um, effective empathy is what we generally call empathy, right? That's the, the, the type of empathy that we as lay people typically think of as when we use the word empathy. Um, it's feeling compassion or concern for others. Typically, it's an unconscious response to a person's emotional state. And there's lots of theory about that because since it is unconscious, um, there's lots of questions in the literature about whether you actually can build empathy um, through, through this type of exposure um, because it is such a unconscious or subconscious, I, I guess unconscious um, thing. It's just kind of built into you. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of where there's lots of different ideas about empathy. These are just eight different ways. Uh, Batson, uh, who is a scholar on empathy, uh, has come up with or has found that how people evaluate and look at empathy. So there's lots of different ways to look at empathy. Often when you read something about empathy, you have to really be careful um, to understand how the researchers or authors are approaching it because it could be very different from, you know, just a broad general view of empathy that you might be thinking of. Okay. So in terms of our research um, for this pirates research and the empathy work, uh, we have an IRS grant from the Department of Education. It's a part of the uh, International and Foreign Languages group uh, in the Department of Education. So we have a three-year grant with them to, to look at this. Um, again, we've been using pre and post course survey design uh, with additional post course only self-assessment questions. Um, in terms of our sample, we we uh, we asked tons and tons and tons of people. We had a uh, uh, is it a sample still? I don't know. Uh, we sent the survey to over six thousand students, and this is what we got. Right. So um, uh, we had uh, six 
in our global understanding course, which is our primary virtual exchange course, that's what we did the research on, uh, out of the about 300 students who go through that every semester, we had uh, a total of 84 responses that did both the pre-course and the post-course, which is important. We get a ton that do the pre-course, but not everybody follows up on the post-course, and we have to match mm -hmm. them up. So 68 were female, 84 total, right? Uh, so 16 males. Uh, for the control group, we had 118 total. 68 of 86 of them were female. And again, for that one, we, we actually sent it out to 5,000 students. So yeah, we don't get great response rates. I'm sure most people don't either. Um, what we used was the scale of ethnocultural empathy. Um, we actually, uh, which is Wang et al. Uh, for this, we, for financial reasons, mostly uh, also for, uh, for reasons of really wanting to be able to dig into our own data, uh, we tend to use open source scales in the psychology literature primarily, right? Um, or scales that we have otherwise have access for. Um, even uh, you mentioned the Purdue one, that's the GPI, right? Um, you have to pay for that, right? No, it's OER. Yeah, that, that gets expensive, right? And, and to do that every semester for- right. It's an OER. It's free. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that must that must be the GPI is free. Well, maybe it's not GPI. Maybe it's oh, okay. something else. Um, okay. The one that we've been using, but it's okay. definitely free. Oh, that's good. I, I I'd be curious to know what that one is, um, since unless maybe it is the same one and there's different tracks that, or they've changed. Um, when we looked at it, it, it was not free. Um, but we tend not to want to pay for things, and we yeah. also tend to want to uh, look under the hood before you you commit, which some of the pay ones you can't, um, and also have our own data. So we tend to to look at the literature and select scales. Uh, GPI's Global Perspective Index, which, oh, Iowa, sorry, I was getting my places confused. That's the problem. Okay. Um, but uh, so we use Wang, uh, again, open source, well, published, a published scale. We also actually use another scale. This is the one that we ended up going with when, with our for our results, but we also used uh, something called the IRI intercultural reactivity index, uh, which is actually a better known scale um, and is uh, really very um, very well researched. But what we found when we administered it and um, then looked at the scale points, right, is that that scale is focused on people who are impoverished, right? How do you feel about people who are um, less fortunate than you? It has nothing to do with cultural issues other than socioeconomic status. So we didn't see any changes in that scale at all. The Wang scale focuses on ethnocultural empathy, looking at different cultures and how you feel about different cultures. So again, when, when trying to measure for virtual exchange or global diversity in general, picking that scale is really important um, to make sure you're measuring what you're trying to measure, right? So that's that was a lesson learned um, and we were much more uh, critical of the scales for our future research as we went along. Um, the scale of ethnocultural empathy, though, has four subscales. One is empathic feeling and expression, uh, empathic pe perspective taking, acceptance of cultural differences, and empathic awareness. Okay. So our results. Um, we compared this, this is just comparing all of our, oh, sorry, I don't know if you're seeing that. Um, this is just comparing this first slide, all of our students based on whether they were um, in a global understanding class, again, that's our virtual exchange course or our control group. And what we saw for perspective taking, uh, students, I think just through taking courses in college help helps their perspective taking. But in our global understanding courses, the, the growth was much more significant uh, and, and larger than our 
uh, control group. For empathy, the results were um, a little different, right? The, even though it looks like there's growth, this growth actually isn't statistically significant. Um, when we did our analysis, we have an economist working with us and he used a number of different models and the models were consistently positive uh, that there was positive growth, but none of them reached the level of significance. But the fact that all of them consistently showed, we, we feel we can say that students do gain some empathy, but you'll notice it's it's not a huge amount for the the um, for the control groups. There really was no gain, right? So so this is interesting. Uh, definitely, perspective taking is something that you can kind of train a little bit more uh, than empathy again because it's this unconscious perspective that's just kind of built in. Um, when we look at this a, a little bit more, we I mentioned that we uh, looked at this in comparison between study abroad, global understanding, our global diversity and domestic diversities. Unfortunately, the, this was uh, 2021 that we did this research, so no study abroad. Um, and the way we kind of put this together, because our economist is really brilliant, but incomprehensible to someone who's not an economist. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> completely, completely. Like, I'm like, his name is Greg. I'm like, Greg, put this in terms that I can understand. And I, I will put a caveat there. I do qualitative research all the time, but not at his level, right? So um, we kind of decided to look at this at the median student in each of these courses compared to the control. After taking each of these types of courses, where does that median student end up? Do they increase? Do they decrease their position? Um, can so, I just jump in and ask something? Yeah. So um, MC Montoya brought up a really good point. Like, uh, are you getting the perspective taking in this information from the country, uh, from people in, an, in another country that you're working with? Is this a mush of, of ECU and the yeah. people that you're working with? So, so that's a very interesting and good question. And I apologize. I always have a problem following the chat. So hope, thank you. Jump in yeah. anyone uh, when, uh, when you have a question. So we actually do administer this survey to both our domestic and our international students. Um, we also present those findings every year in our annual report to our partners. Uh, however, this particular data, because it's uh, grant funded and IRB approved and we have inducements is only based on ECU student responses um, because we can't couldn't get all the buy-in for uh, if we if we did it with all of our partners we'd have to go through every one of their IRB boards not all of them even have IRB boards right wow. um, so so it wow. was at least that's what our IRB group said we'd have to do and that just wasn't going to be reasonable. Um, given our time commitment. So this, this, these results in particular are based only on ECU, but we do do assessment for all, both sides. Got it. Okay. So um, this second slide again, let me just, hold on. I have too many things open. Okay. Okay. So this second slide shows where, where students ended up. So again, global understanding, this was significant for perspective taking. And the person in the 50, 50th percentile compared to the person in the 50th percentile in the control group ended up uh, increasing by eight percentage points, whereas the other one stayed where the control group stayed where they are compared to that control group. Um, our other courses did not do so well. Right. This is why we're kind of focusing on our global diversity and domestic diversity courses for to help them build strategies to increase perspective taking. Why this is not sure. Different theories um, that one of which is that these courses don't include uh, uh, having the voices of the people they're talking about. Right. It's it's me as the professor lecturing about it, right? Domestic diversity, you'd think they, they would because there's just diversity within the classroom itself, but we're not sure why this is, but our, our global diversity and domestic diversity courses aren't doing that great. 
when it comes to empathy, though, um, we're not even doing that great, right? We again, this is not statistically significant. We think there is a the preponderance of evidence says it helps improve, but just marginally, um, our our domestic diversity and global diversity even less so. Um, what was interesting, though, is if we break down the the empathy scores, uh, the cognitive empathy and effective empathy, perspective taking and empathy by gender, what we see is the growth that we see tends to be among female students, right? So um, again, perspective taking was significant for uh, uh, for global understanding, not for the the, the control. Uh, it was not significant for empathy, but we do see more growth if we separate it out by gender. Uh, lots of ideas about why that is, but our idea, and hopefully we'll we'll open it up to you guys to see if you have other ideas, that is that this might be an issue of privilege that females tend to. Um, Females just in general are more empathetic, but also with perspective taking, uh, they are able to kind of see other people's perspectives. And, and again, we're kind of viewing this as privilege and we'll see why in just a second where the results breaking it down a little bit further, um, right? You know, when someone doesn't have to think about how others approach something or doesn't have to adjust the way they behave because everybody caters to them, which basically is what privilege is all about, right? They don't need to employ those skills, so they don't develop those skills. It's not a part of their life. So we actually see females are the are the highest, Black females highest, right? Um, uh, among uh, men, Black males uh, do better than white males. White men are the worst. Uh, when I presented this at a, at a IVEC, I, I, my, my John, my co-author hates when I say this, I, I summarize it as white men suck. Um, so <laughs> that, that's my chat, take on it. In the, chat, in the chat, um, Annette asked if are females more open to learning and being self-analytical? Yeah, see, that's a good question. And that's something we'd have to we'd have to look into, but I think that very well could could be it, right? So here we we broke it down by males and females, right? This is for the global understanding course where we saw a significant increase in perspective taking. The, the males and females start out about the same place. The females grow so much, the males, eh. Yeah, they don't need to understand the other person's perspective. Eh, it's okay. Um, with empathy, it's even more shocking, right? the females start way higher than the males to begin with. Um, and then the females slightly improve again, this isn't statistically significant, so it's hard to say, but the males will be generous in saying that they don't improve. We'd be, um, again, it's not statistically significant. So, but if you took it for what it looks like, they do even worse after taking a course, mm -hmm. right? So it, what is that issue? You know, again, we're kind of relating it to privilege. Um, we, we've been talking about it more um, and, and are thinking about something else as well. Uh, we've been doing research also tied to this uh, about friendship and consistently for the past, since we started, we've been asking about friendship. Have you developed friends with any of your partners that you were paired with? Um, and in our courses, they get paired with um, Part, students from three different countries for four weeks each over the course of the semester. So we ask, have you made friends with any one of your partners? And typically they have three of them. Um, those students who say they've made friends uh, show consistently higher growth, right? So we haven't looked at the intersection of empathy and this idea of friend, friendship, but one thing we want to investigate, and we'll probably do that uh, soon, is if there is an intersection between that and whether just females are better able to make friends and more open to that type of thing, um, and that impacts then their, their growth in empathy and perspective taking. Again, we don't really know why. 
Um, so that's all I'm going to present. I'm going to stop sharing my screen unless anybody has something they want to look at. But and I'll just open it up to a discussion. So great. Um, Maria Christina put in the chat. Um, sometimes it may also be part of their shy personality. She has two females this semester who are having a hard time opening up and they did the interaction very strictly as an assignment and they were read by Colombians as being rude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I would like to to contextualize a little bit more what's going on with my coil. And and also I, I had to excuse me. I'm sorry, Maria. Uh, can you put it in the chat? Because we got to give some airtime to Jose Luis. Oh, okay, um, okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. I'm so okay. sorry. And I also intervened yeah. during the questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. But um, so should maybe we should um people start putting questions in the chat for Jamie. And then if Jose Luis wants to um, speak and share, and then um, we can have big discussion in just a couple minutes. How does that sound? Jose Luis, do you want to? Yes. Um, well, I, I want to mention um, most of my research and also is anthropological and is qualitative and actually it, it has been long term i i started uh, since i i got here in venezuela studying behavior of students in a crisis situation and i was concentrating in that type of crisis situation and um basically um observation is uh, one of the main tools observation of behavior uh, is one of the main tools. Uh, also, uh, video, uh, video uh, assessment, uh, self-assessment of students, which uh, consistently uh, sin, uh, since 2015, I started as um, in general education in general. And then uh, since uh, 2019, when I started researching empathy with my partner from U Albany, that we started doing pre and post tests consistently and analyzing the data. But uh, I think that, that, that when we are, as you said, Jamie, we are talking about a, 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 a complex dynamic phenomenon that is not static and uh doing survey uh it it, it it limits way too much the phenomenon so since uh, we started working in this assessment group every friday for more than two years one of my main things has been always not limiting assessment to just one tool you have to, in, in a dynamic uh, um, phenomenon, you have to have multiple tools to measure it, to study that phenomenon. And for me, is the, 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 the uh, choosing of the projects, the topic that the students choose to develop through their COIL collaboration is one of the things that it indicates very well if there is a process of understanding and empathy is the, the, this the self assessment, but also one of the most powerful tools on understanding, of course, when we are talking about qualitative, you have to have a long term study and finding patterns that repeat over and over and over to quantify those repeating patterns. But it, it, one of the things that I uh, uh, disagree in terms of the um, sex um, because I have found like in terms of problem solving when the when a uh, multicultural conflict has happened in a collaboration uh, male have why male American male have deal with the issues very well uh, I, 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 it it it, it, it I have talked uh, with Hope about this uh, before that, uh, I mean, 
in, in, in several situations that there has been a conflict and a strong conflict because of the situation, the political situation in Venezuela and some students from here uh, uh, against American students and how male, white male students from the United States have solved the situation, have deal with the situation. And um, so in th that term, I have different uh, readings. And um, one of the things that I have been doing consistently, and we have been presenting in IVIC uh, every year, so the students have been presenting, is the meta research circles that after every coil, students do a research on their uh, relations, a, a video documentary on their experience. And we have been consistently presenting that at IVIC. And the last one last year in Valencia, students uh, uh, presented actually about virtual empathy. And, and they're, 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 uh, what it was fascinating, it, it was that they analyzed their own surveys, their own pre and post tests. And they, 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 they came with the conclusions on the, the, their input on empathy. And it was fascinating because it's not only, I mean, if we're talking about a dynamic phenomenon, uh, it means that even when they are assessing their own behavior, they are still learning and they are still modifying their behavior at, at the moment that they are doing that. And uh, I, I, I just uh, would like, if it's possible, to share a few seconds of the video that we presented at IVA, that the student presented at IVA, just to give you an idea of how they assess it, they, their own empathy processes. So uh, let's okay, see. Okay, just a few seconds because we want to also have time for discussion. Okay, okay. So, and then, you... and then also, if you could put the link in the chat or our meeting notes, that would be great. Okay, so you want to talk and. Um... No, go ahead and show a little bit of the video and then let's go. Okay, it's just talk. a few seconds just to give you an idea on what uh, what it, it did empatía en todos los procesos humanos que cada persona afronta emoción conexión comunicación aprendizaje única descubrimiento intercambio interés compañerismo innovación diferente inclinante expectante so this so is a, are these a, the words that each of these particular per people picked up themselves? They, uh, I, 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 hold on, let me just get out of here. Uh, these are the, yes, they are from the pre and post test. They analyzed the pre and post test and they found the, 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 the main words that were repeating on the pre and post test. And uh, that's what they uh, presented. Uh, I, I just want to finish this. Okay, so uh, 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 what um, my point is here is the, the multiplicity of tools to study empathy and uh, focus groups, uh, pre and post test, uh, video reflections, uh, self assessments, uh, all that combination of tools to measure what empathy is and how they are. Uh, affecting, but one of the points that also important to mention here it is that in four to six to ten weeks you are not going to modify a behavior because there is multiple uh, factors that influence the openness of a, a, a person uh, towards other people. It has to do with family. It has to do with life situations. You have to do many, many, many factors. So in a COIL project, you, 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 you briefly 
are gonna start opening their eyes in terms of empathy, but it's just very limited. That That's what I wanted to mention. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> A lot to unpack. Um, yeah, and so there's been some good questions in the chat. Um, and I'd like to start with um, the, something also that MC Montoya brought up that the US students saw COIL as an assignment and that the Colombians saw it as an opportunity. And so even on that level, there is a difference of what you're doing. Does anybody want to touch that? Because to me, that that's something. Yeah, I, I, I think that's really very interesting, too, because to me, again, it kind of relates to, to this privilege idea. And, and we see that a lot. Like right now I'm here in Namibia, right? And for, for these students, and I was in Indonesia a few months ago doing the same thing, introducing them to virtual exchange and getting them involved in a project. And for, for those students, this was such an opportunity, right? This was something that was so valuable to them. But for American students, we're kind of jaded, right? We It's an assignment. It's what we do. Some of them love it. And of course, most of them enjoy it. But it doesn't have the sparkle. And again, I bring it to some somewhat of a privilege issue, right? Like we have lots of opportunities that maybe uh, particularly in places uh, like here in Namibia and Indonesia, they just don't have that opportunity. Like there's no chance of them going abroad. There's very few uh, international people in their community. Um, so this is a very special opportunity. So, um Jose Luis, do you have an assignment both for the U.S. students and for the Venezuelans for the U.S. students to have a better understanding to sort of like exercise the empathy muscle in um, sort of in general with the different courses that you run? And I'm wondering, it it does seem in some ways what what I'm getting out of this is that we really need an orientation for our students that take into account, as Jamie brought up, privilege, and also um, Jose Luis is bringing up empathy and the recognition of the students, even regardless. I mean, I know Adele was working her students at Maritime College. So these are students becoming merchant Marines who worked with students in Ukraine this past year, and they had a lot of trouble um, because guess what? There's a war going on and um, how do you handle that? So there are all these factors. And I'm just actually curious, Jose Luis, do you have some sort of assignment to get the US students to have more sensitivity to being more empathetic to start with? Well, uh, the, we have a very, very interesting assignment that is uh, um, talking about what popular culture is. And that's the trigger to um, uh, the, 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 the difference of understanding what popular culture is from, from American students and Venezuelan students. It starts, sparks those differences, uh, uh, those discussions. And we have found that that's, that's the very effective. And again, we, 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 for example, in the case that I described of a male, white male student, um, there was a, a female Venezuelan student who thought that um, a, a, a American uh, vision of popular culture was imperialistic. And they had to come with an assignment of, of, of of doing a video. And uh, actually the male American student handled the situation very well. Uh, he, he was very patient. He uh, very, was very conciliating, but uh, the term of deciding what popular culture is the trigger and a very fascinating way to start like seeing how the power dynamics of cultures and uh, 
uh, it, it, it's fascinating because uh, I, I, this course specifically is uh, popular culture and contemporary media. And we analyze stereotypes on how Hollywood imposes stereotypes of culture, of gender, of uh, uh, race. And that discussion, it opens uh, their, 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 their conception and changes pers perspectives very well. Hmm. Hey, Annette, do you wanna comment further about uh, your point in terms of what you put in the chat? No, I was just thinking a lot of um, students but listening to the point about, yeah, students being jaded, jaded and that being a problem, but it's also a problem when um, I think people think too that COIL can do more than it can or any opportunity can do more than it can. Like we want students to do internships and we want them to get out of network. But I know what we find a lot, even just at our university, students thinking, okay, if I'll do this, then X, Y, and Z will happen right and it's who you know and fortunately sometimes the more a student is starting off in a precarious financial situation right which often we see too with our international students the more they think okay i've met this person this person can give me a job and i just i, I run into that a lot i'll meet somebody and <laughs> i just had an email this week you know called connection and someone who's completely not in my field thinking I can help them to get a job here or back in their home country. And so I think that's, you know, it's important, of course, to see the things as opportunities, but also not think of in this one moment, COIL or the people you meet or how you learn necessarily, it, you know, is transformative. It's kind of, you know, it, it takes a lot. Um, for the students to do themselves and many other opportunities to to get to where they're going i don't know that's probably kind of going on a tangent although i do like the kind of work integrated learning but i do think there may be people out there who's you know we shouldn't be selling them do this and these other great things will happen because we don't deliver that or don't always or can't so So, so that's too much, but just when I heard the word opportunity versus assignment, I thought opportunity is just as dangerous or as sad as treating it only as an assignment. <laughs> it could be. Yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. I also wonder how much of what is considered to be the social or cultural norm in these countries need to be taken into consideration when we're setting up these different strategies because and I'm gonna this wasn't isn't a coil course, but I'm um part of an international research group that we're trying to create like a toolbox for faculty and leadership to use to address incivility in the workplace. And so we we um piloted it here in New York and had really, really, really good results. And then we we did it in Ireland with the same format exactly like we literally duplicated it and we didn't have we had we had good results but we didn't have the exact same results because part of our toolbox was this role playing where it was um kind of helping them work out crucial conversations and dealing with incivility and our the little the um the um situations or the 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 uh, scenarios, that's where I wanted, scenarios weren't as effective in Ireland because they didn't view them as rude. They didn't view them as uncivil because there, they, what they consider to be rude and civil is a little bit different, I mean, than ours. For example, you know, if you're at work and somebody starts cussing at you, you're going to see that as uncivil. Well, in Ireland, they kind of use cuss words like their like punctuation. They don't see that rude at all. That's just part of their everyday conversation. So in these scenarios, although they were still able to understand the concepts of the strategies, it didn't have the same import of changing their awareness because to them, that that was, you know, they thought it was kind of silly that we found this scenario to be rude. So in, in going forward, we're going to be doing the, the same um, tool or introducing the same toolbox in Australia this fall. We're working with our Australian group 
to come up with much more specific scenarios that they, that the the Australians will understand to be uncivil. So that way the, the, the strategies will be much more effective. And I just wonder with these COIL classes, if instead of having both groups do the exact same you know, assignments, if it has to be, it should be more individualized to what is appropriate for their culture. Yeah, well, and that's when we have disparate um, disciplines too, that also helps with that. But Jamie, go ahead and then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so that, that one that's very interesting, I, 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 your project sounds really fascinating, Jennifer, but I, I was gonna comment on what Maria wrote uh, about, you know, building awareness, essentially, you know, one of the issues with empathy is that it's um, unconscious, right? So sure, you probably do want to make sure your students are aware of what's going on in the other country to develop their awareness. But if they aren't, don't already have empathy, telling them these things isn't going to make them empathetic to those issues, right? If they don't already have empathy. So, so to me, the challenge isn't, you know, the challenge is more, how do we build that empathy through virtual exchange, right? It should, there should be, or at least this is how we thought going into it, empath uh, because they're experiencing not just I was told that these students live this life. They're hearing it from the students themselves. They're they're um, seeing the impact of that through the conversations and through the projects. And um, our hope is that that helps to build empathy. But again, that's that's really a struggle. Go ahead, Maria. Um, yes, I, I agree that it's a struggle just to get, it, we're talking about relationships and from our leadership position, we're trying to build relationships and we don't know when is enough to intervene, what is that we need to intervene or not. So I have found that the way I divide the COIL plan and I start with icebreakers that are more descriptive, I try not to unless a problem happens, I intervene and I tell them, oh, Colombians lead their lives like this, or they have this, or they may have these problems. But at the beginning, I try not to tell them anything, but prompt them with an icebreaker as soon as we start, an icebreaker where uh, it is as simple as uh, talk about your daily schedule at your college, uh, share a picture of the favorite place in your campus, but why is your favorite place? Why is that you do this here? Why is that you pick this place? So, so your point is to really sort of guide them. Guide in, them in, to share their ideas, uh, to share images, so they can uh -huh. start getting to understand that there may be similarities or differences, but there are different groups. And then after that, questions arise and then when those questions arise is when I take the class on my own in my own classroom and I clarify those pictures or those comments that they have found out through the icebreaker because if I lecture them about the differences being a Colombian I also have a different perspective because I'm a Colombian here not a Colombian there so so it's hard because we are dealing with relationships and you cannot really guide that a relationship will go well or not Hi. <laughs> I feel like we're we have I mean it's so fraught and like more goodies and things popping out here. Um, I, I'd really like, cause we need to stop. Um, I would love to have anybody have some suggestions of next steps because as I think Annette suggested next time we meet next month, we'll talk about um, how to unpack this some more, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to all of you. Yeah, Jose Luis, and then we really have to stop. Yeah, very, very quick. But one of the things that is uh, anthropology, uh, ethnography and qualitative research, the most beautiful thing about qualitative research is it brings more questions. 
it doesn't bring answers. So mm. that's what we are doing. Good point. Really good point. And perhaps that's where we should stop because I think that's actually a really nice way to think about it. Thank you, Jose Luis. And thank you, Jamie. Can everybody give a warm round of applause to our two folks? And thank, thank you. you so much for um, tunneling in here from um, very far away. And um, good luck on your travels tomorrow, Jamie. And please come yeah. back anytime. We um, meet and discuss this stuff every month and try to get somewhere. And um, we talk about technology and COIL the first week of the month and pedagogy and COIL the second Friday of the month and culture and DEI issues the third and um, assessment the fourth. So um, thank you so much for joining us and for really sharing some great ideas. And um, I will share the recording of this with everyone. And um, we're just going to keep going. <laughs> Thank you all. So have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so Bye. much, everybody, for really great, great discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.